is Sky Chi Ilera coming from Penn State, and she's presenting on optics with speed. Testing, testing, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Tara, for the introduction. I will be talking about optic dextrosin for today. Um, let's go on with the case. So um, this patient is a 28-year-old Caucasian female that presented to Dr. Petty's ophthalmology clinic back in June of 2013. Her chief complaint was um, tearing and scratching and itching sensation of the eyes bilaterally. Um, she, the, she was diagnosed at that moment with recurrent corneal erosion secondary to an insufficient tear film and the uh, fundoscopic exam was deferred at that time. She then returned in um, August of this year just for a routine eye exam, and what we found is her visual acuity with correction was, uh, was very good. Her right eye was 20 over 15 and left 20-20. Her intraocular pressure was within normal range at 12 bilaterally. Her confrontational fields were full, and her slit lamp exam was unremarkable. Fundus exam, however, revealed optic nerve drusen bilaterally with a cup to disc ratio of 0.1. The macula, periphery, and blood vessels were within normal limits. Ancillary grid testing revealed no abnormalities and ne neither did the visual field exam. These are some pictures of her autofluorescent imaging of her left and right eye. As you can see, you see pockets of hyper autofluorescence that demarcate the location of the drusen. They also did some fundus photography, and again, you can see um, hyperlucent areas demarcating where the drusen are, especially you can see them in the margins. So a little bit on optic disc drusen. This is a con benign congenital condition of the optic disc optic canal or vasculature. It is usually an incidental finding on fundoscopic exam. It is generally, like I said, very benign. Um, per studies, they um, suggest an incidence of 0.34%. However, postmortem analysis um, suggests a higher prevalence at 0.4 to 2%. Um, heritability has been suggested, but no clear pattern has been identified. It seems to run higher within families, but again, they haven't found a clear pattern of inheritance. Um, bilateral findings are usually seen in 75 to 85% of patients with optic disc drusen. So just a little bit on optic disc anatomy. This right here is the lamina cribrosa. This is a meshwork of collagen fibers that inserts to both sides of the sclera. This is the sclera right here on both sides, um, through which the optic nerve runs through to exit the eye. Um, the importance of, the, of this structure in optic disc drusen is that drusen deposit anteriorly to this lamina cribrosa. So when you get enough drusen, the, the lamina cribrosa can um, displace a little posteriorly, and these um, sort of patches can deform and cause compression on the axons exiting the eye. A little bit on the pathophysiology. So basically, drusen are deposits of mucopolysaccharides, ribo and amino nucleic acids, calcium and iron that deposit, like I said, anterior to the lamina cribrosa. The pathology suggested for um, these drusen is that um, it's secondary to an inherited dysplastic optic canal that causes compression, again, of this structure called the lamina cribrosa. Um, this, um, in turn, causes a narrowing of the space through which the axons go through to exit the eye. It is believed that this compression causes ax um, axonal metabolism abnormalities, therefore causing calcium ions to deposit on these right here, which would represent the mitochondria. Eventually, this compression causes the axonal axons to disrupt, and the calcified mitochondria, excuse me, um, extrude towards the extracellular space, and eventually these calcified mitochondria coalesce to what we call drusen. That's just a pain in my hand, so. Um, there are two types of drusen um, in the optic nerve. There's buried versus superficial, and um, what you see at fundoscopic exam actually depends on the time of diagnosis. So here's the evolution of drusen here. This is what we call buried disc drusen. Buried disc drusen is more common in childhood. Um, and what you see on fundoscopic exam is a little bit blurring of the margins and elevation of the optic disc. 
This is what we call an appearance of pseudopapilledema, so it is important to distinguish this from true papilledema and other pathologies. This eye is now this eye 10 years later. As you can see, there's quite a difference. Um, here you can see the visible drusen, especially on the disc margins. Despite this progression of drusen, um, people are usually asymptomatic and retain normal visual acuity. Um, the most common symptom reported in people with optic distrusion are visual field defects. These defects can range from um, a nasal step, arcuate scotoma, or an enlarging of the blind spot. Um, different studies report different um, incidence of visual field defe defects, ranging from 24 to 87%. I know that's a big range, but it really does depend on the study that you look at. But these visual field defects, however, are very mild. Patients don't notice them because they occur over such a long period of time, over decades, that it really does not um, seem to bother the patient. And these visual field defects are most common in people with superficial drusen as opposed to the buried one that you see in childhood. Differential diagnosis for optic disc drusen include papilledema, a tilted disc, crowded disc associated with hyperopia, retinoblastoma, and astrocytic hamartoma. The one I will focus more um, in this lecture will be papilledema, just because that is one of the most concerning diagnoses that you have to exclude, especially when you see a patient with buried disc drusen. Um, this is a fundoscopic photograph of a person with buried disc drusen versus a person with papilledema. Um, as you can see here in the photograph in the person with buried disc drusen, again, you see a slight elevation of the optic nerve. You see um, uh, some blurring of the margins. The optic distance not appear um, hyperemic, and you can follow all the blood vessels exiting the optic nerve. This right here is just a small papillary hemorrhage. That's one of the complications of optic disc drusen that I will discuss later. Um, this is in comparison to papilledema here. Again, the disc here looks very swollen. You have blurring of the um, blood vessels exiting the disc, which is more suggestive of papilledema. Diagnostic testing that can be done to differentiate between these two pathologies include a beta scan ultrasound. Here you have a picture of a person with optic disc drusen. Um, this right here is, represents the drusen. This is a hyper echogenic focus that is in the retina optic nerve junction. This right here is the optic nerve, and right here is the retina. Um, the degree of shadowing from this drusen depends on the size of the drusen. This is in comparison to a Bay scan ultrasound of a person with papilledema. As, um, in a person with increased intracranial pressure, the pressure is transmitted through the subdural space and causes an increase of the optic nerve diameter, giving it a more widened appearance, as you can see compared to this right here. Um, additionally, you can also see a uh, echolucent circle that demarcates the separation of the optic nerve from the optic sheath, and this is called the crescent sign. Um, another way to differentiate um, buried optic distrusion from papilledema is through fluorescein angiography. This is a patient with um, optic distrusion. Again, you see pockets of hyperfluorescence. You don't see any leaking of the dye anywhere, which is compared to right here. This is a person, a fluorescein angiogram of a person with papilledema. Again, the optic disc looks very swollen, and you see extravasation of the dye from the vessels. And OCT, OCT, um, from my reading, it shows that OCT is one of the best ways to monitor retinal nerve fiber layer changes from drusen over time. Um, there was an article that was published in JAMA Ophthalmology in 2009 looking at the differences in OCT characteristics between um, papilledema and optic disc drusen, and what they found is if the nerve fiber layer is greater than 78 millimeters, it has an 80% specificity and 90% sensitivity for um, papilledema. Another uh, thing that they found is that this angle right here called the alpha, alpha angle, if it's more than 141 degrees, it is 90% specific for um, optic disc drusen. Here you see an OCT again of optic disc drusen. As you can see, the optic ner nerve head appears elevated. The internal contour is very um, irregular. And again, here's where the drusen would be. This is just to show you what a CT scan of optic disc drusen would um, look like if 
someone were to be concerned for um, in increased intracranial pressure and did a CT scan. Here, as you can see, the Drusen, this is a non-contrast um, bone, bone window of the, um, of the orbits, and here you can see this um, hyper-dense lesion that corresponds to the Drusen. Complications of ODD um, include transient visual loss, prepapillary or um, peripapillary hemorrhages, retinal vascular occlusions, and peripapillary subretinal neovascularization. Transient vision loss is seen in about 8.6% of people with optic disc drusen. Um, it is thought that drusen increase the interstitial pressure and decrease the perfusion pressure within the optic disc. So they have suggested that maybe changes in CSF, arterial or venous pressure could cause transient optic disc ischemia that would um, be seen as a transient visual loss or graying out of your visual field. Another complication is a peripapillary hemorrhage, as you can see right here. They're usually very superficial and single and do not affect and have a very good visual prognosis. Another complication seen with optic distrusion are retinal vascular occlusions, both arterial or venous. Um, they tend to occur in younger patients about in their mid-20s. Um, and this is thought to result from the, vas the crowding and compression of the vessels that are going through the lamina cribrosa by the drusen. And last but not least, there's the peripapillary subretinal neovascularization. This is a very rare complication of optic distrusen. Nevertheless, it has been documented. Um, here on this picture, you see the drusen around the optic nerve. And temporal to the optic nerve, you see this area of hyperpigmentation that um, demarcates the uh, neovascularization. This can be, this um, complication is usually mild and self-resolving. However, if it's around the macula and central visual acuity is compromised, laser photocoagulation has been suggested as a treatment. Um, for treatment, there is no treatment proven to alter the course of optic distrusion. Like I said, it's generally a very benign disease that doesn't cause a lot of visual abnormalities. Um, Nevertheless, through my readings, they said that you should have a baseline visual field testing at the time of diagnosis, just to have a background in case a person develops other ocular pathologies that can compromise visual fields, such as glaucoma. Like I said, one of the visual field defects that you can see in optic distrusion in our nasal steps and arcuate scotomas, which can be, um, which can also be seen in glaucoma. Um, they also recommend that patients be followed um, with serial visual field exams, optic nerve fiber analysis, and repeat intraocular pressure sh checks. It doesn't say how often you should do it. I think it just depends on the physician and if the patient is having any sort of visual field defects. And that's my bibliography. Any questions? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, what condition did you say? Oh, yes. Um, there is some association, but they didn't find very many. It was very few documented cases, which is why I didn't put it up as one of the complications. But it would be non-arteritic um, anterior optic ischemic neuropathy that they think is secondary to compression of drusen. Um, uh, no, they, um, from, what, from my reading, they said that um, just the compression causes this abnormal sort of metabolism within the axon, and the calcium ions within the axon start depositing in the mitochondria, and once the axon disrupts, they just protrude out, and more calcium ions that are in the extracellular um, space um, deposit on the mitochondria, and eventually these mitochondria somehow coalesce and form the drusen. So they have a very high... Um, concentration of calcium ions. Um, the reason why they're hyperfluorescent, that I don't know, I didn't look it up, but I don't, we don't know what um, ingredient is within the drusen that cause it to autofluoresce. Any other questions? No. Thank you.